from almost the first moment that I entered the big room clutching my bottle. My attention was riveted upon a girl who was there. I say a girl, but in fact she was considerably older than I was, thirty at least, I should suppose. She was very blonde and slender, almost ethereal. She had the greenest eyes I'd ever seen, or have ever seen since, and the biggest too. She wore white boots which went right up under her dress. If this girl worked in my bank, I'd certainly not seen her there. We were never introduced or anything like that, but I simply couldn't bother about anyone else who was there, male or female. I simply gravitated towards and around her. In the end, she said, Hello. You look unhappy. I nodded. That was partly because I was shy and speechless. Come and sit by me, she said, and have a drink. Well, the drink was the usual dreadful stuff that you get at parties where everyone's mucking in, but three or four glasses, each of something different, gave me more confidence, and in the end I was conversing with the girl quite intelligently. We had all kinds of things in common, like books and films and concerts, which I used to go in for at that time as much as I could, and in no time at all I was in seventh heaven. It was absolutely the first time in my life that I had entered that region, and, as it happens, it was more or less the last time also. The rest of them were making more and more noise until it was exactly like the bank, or like the sort of tavern my father used to look for. In the end, my girl said, let's explore. We went upstairs and entered what I suppose was the parents' bedroom. We sat together on the bed. I say, I said, who are you? I'm Laura, she said. She did tell me her other name, but I'm keeping that to myself. She even told me her address and telephone number, and of course I should have written them down, but I suppose them to be burned on my brain forever, as one does at that age. I'm Andrew, I said, and she smiled at me mysteriously. So I put my arm around her shoulders and should have liked to turn out the light, but I knew the door was unlocked and did not dare to go so far as to lock it. She was wearing a thin, greeny dress with a pattern on it like waves. I'd never seen a dress like it, but, why, well, it's impossible to describe. Andrew, she said, looking at me with her enormous eyes, I do love you. Oh, let me tell you, it was the supreme moment of my entire life, though I didn't realise that at the time. But then she cried, Andrew, I must go and telephone, I'd quite forgotten. You made me forget. Oh, you, you will come back, I gasped out. Of course, it was dangerous for her to leave the room at all. That was obvious enough. Even so, her reply astonished me. I shall always come back, was what she said. She pulled up her boots and flitted out. Laura didn't come back. In the end, it seemed quite certain that she must have heard something on the telephone which had made her leave at once. I did not care to ask anyone. I was downcast enough on the way home, and it became worse when I realised that I'd forgotten both Laura's exact address and her telephone number. However, I knew her name right enough, and I remembered the name of the road she'd given me. Immediately I reached my digs, I looked Laura up in the communal telephone directory and found that the page was missing. It was not that it had been torn out, though the other chaps often did that. I examined the binding, and it seemed that that particular page had never been there. I slept not one wink that night between rapture and regret. But in the end, I left the banking floor and I was given a more confidential job of toting records from place to place. It was inevitable that I saw more of the world, though I didn't always like what I saw. On several occasions I even thought of marrying and the different girls seemed quite keen to have me, but each time I drew back at the last moment. Most men value their freedom, of course, but it was really Laura that was the trouble with me. She'd transfix me. I could never get her out of my thoughts. Though you may think this odd, because I believe it was as much as eight or ten years before I saw or heard of her again. I was in Paris and strolling through the Parc Monceau on business, when all among the prams and nursemaids I saw her on a seat. My heart turned over. I was all but sick with the shock. Hello, she said. You look unhappy. I am, I said. It's your fault. You must know that. She smiled in that way which so confused me. In which case, we'll go and have a drink and make it up. 
Oh, you must be cold. I couldn't help saying it because she was wearing very much the same dress and the same sort of boots. And it was a blustery day in Paris with rain every now and then and worse undoubtedly to come. I've been waiting too, she said reproachfully. She never added much to that. We wandered off across the park to a funny little place in a side street. On the way, though, really it wasn't far, we passed a ghastly street accident. Or perhaps it was something worse. I tried not to look at it. And as she said nothing, of course I didn't. We began mixing our drinks again in the same unwise way and talking about all those things we had in common. Though, naturally, we both went to fewer films and concerts and read fewer books than before. Oh, but that applies to almost everyone. I realised with a little shiver she might well be 40 by now, or at least 38. I can only say that she did not look it. She looked devastating, in a slightly peculiar way. In the end, I began eating as well as drinking, though <laughs> she would only nibble. While I was in the middle of one of those hashed-up mock steaks, the patron came up in his red apron and whispered into Laura's ear. She rose instantly. Excusez-moi, she said absent-mindedly, and as if I'd been a Frenchman. Well, she pulled herself together and added, back in a moment, smiling a smile. Then, before I could get out a word, she walked quickly out of the café. Oh, yes, this time I tore right after her, but the patron clutched at me and held me back by brute force. I suppose he was frightened for his bill, but alternatively it might have been that he knew something I didn't. I mooched miserably about in the chilly drizzle for, I dare say, an hour and a half, trying to keep the cafe entrance under observation. But I knew in my bones that Laura would not return. Not there, anyway. Not then. Within only a couple of years, I got down at last to proposing marriage, and Cecilia Susan accepted me at once. I was perfectly determined to work at the marriage, and obviously it was only fair that I should, but Laura stood more hopelessly in the light than I had supposed possible. I never said a word about her to Cecilia Susan. It would have sounded so utterly unrealistic. Nor were things helped by the fact that our two children, only a year apart actually, died in an accident at the nursery school. I'm sure you heard about it, or read about it at the time. There were questions in Parliament and a big inquiry, at which we both gave evidence. In the end, Cecilia Susan left me for a more practical chap ten years younger than I was, and eight years younger than she was. There was a quick divorce, and I've never seen or heard of Cecilia Susan since. All this time, I was working for these new people, having left the bank soon after the Park Monceau business. It's a funny sort of job, but it pays a lot better, and it's occasionally quite exciting. There was a meeting at a big hotel near... Well, I won't name it. It was in the north of Italy. <laughs> That'll give you the picture. Not actually in the town either, as I say. The gathering was international, cosmopolitan, all those things. And believe me, it was pretty tense. By then, I was accustomed to almost anything. But suddenly, I'd had enough, and I went out for a breather. I hate a pet room. I went downstairs, and there at a the table in the lounge sat Laura. She was looking out through the big window at all the snow and ice and tempest. I did not say that she was dressed in exactly the same way, not at all, but it was a version of the same garb in every detail, and she looked, well, ageless might be the best word. I stood back. I was petrified. It had been a terrible afternoon upstairs, if I'm to be honest about it, and now here in the dusk was this. In the end, Laura turned and saw me. You do look unhappy, she said. Come and sit by me. Well, I could hardly cut and run. In any case, we're all virtually snowed up. But needless to say, I did not want to do anything of the kind. Calm judgment was useless where Laura was concerned. I find it almost always is useless. She filled a glass from a big decanter of red wine. It was as if the glass had been set there for me and waiting. Wine of oblivion, said Laura, smiling. At least this time, we seem not to propose mixing them, and inevitably, by now, we no longer read books at all or bothered ourselves with films and, and concerts or anything like that. How long are you staying, I asked, with one part of my mind still on the drifting snow. It doesn't matter, said Laura. 
There will be future occasions. I laughed and everyone in the lounge looked up, except for the very old and the very deaf. The intervals are a bit on the long side, I said. One day there won't be a second to spare, she replied in a matter-of-fact way. I expect I stared at her like a fool. Now, if you like, she said. Well, I suppose I continued to stare. In my work I'd become ready with conventional words, but only with those. Come and see, she said, with that all-dissolving smile of hers. Do you mind carrying the wine? I followed her upstairs, back upstairs where I was concerned. In the conference room there seemed to be total silence, which was absurd and impossible. She wove in and out on the first floor of the hotel, then pushed open a dingy and ill-painted door, not up to the general standard of the place, and held it for me to pass through with the big decanter in one hand and the two big wine glasses slipping about in the other. Beyond was a very big corridor, ill-lighted and with battered bedroom doors on either side. There were holes in the carpet and big cracks in the plaster of the ceiling through which things might emerge when most people had gone to bed. One could not help thinking of that. Plainly it was a wing which had been virtually closed and not only for the off-season, one would suggest. I marvelled that Laura should, as I presumed, sleep there and dwell there. Before long, I was unable to reconcile so long a corridor with the outside of the building, as I'd glimpsed it for a moment on arrival. On and on and on I tramped after her, tripping over the ragged carpet, coping with my slithery burdens. She opened a door to our left. I felt immediately that it might have been any door. She stood at the portal, smiling. Really... She was much too lightly clad for the dreadful chill of that corridor where the central heating had been so long turned off. In her wavy dress, she looked more like the sea in summer, though deep and mighty. <laughs> but you wouldn't possibly understand what I mean. You would have had to be there. One day perhaps you will be. I could only just see into the room. By the few glimmering lights in the corridor, totally insufficient for modern hotel visitors, I could discern in the room only rotting woodwork and huge worms and soiled rags on the floor. Come in and have a drink with me, bad Laura. Then I can look after you properly. After a second or two of silence between us, she gently added, You might call me your guardian angel. No one should think I made a fool of myself. Not at all. I'd been very fully trained in self-control. I set down the heavy decanter on the threshold, and though one of the glasses fell from my hand as I stooped, it did not shatter. I by no means broke into a panicky rush, but at the most what my late father, who came very much into my mind at that moment, would have called a fast jog-trot, which sufficed perfectly well though I don't know what might have happened if by mistake I had run in the wrong direction. Naturally, I've not again seen Laura as yet. I keep telling myself to stop worrying, because such things are not decided by us, but for us.